Okay, uh, today, uh, we're going to take a few notes today on section 6.2. I only got you for about a half hour or so. Um, so, section 6.2, we're going to take a few notes. We have three theorems I want to go over today. We introduced three on Monday. So, if you were gone Monday, you missed a couple of the theorems that uh, uh, we'll discuss today. Now, I'm going to go through this pretty quick, where you may not have enough time on these original three if you were gone Monday to write them down. Uh, but again, I'll put them on the website today and stuff. And um, I think I gotta update that today. I forgot to do that Monday. Uh, but anyway, um, we'll get to, we'll get to that. And I'll put the PowerPoint on there as well so you can read it. Uh, goals today. We're gonna do a quick, I mean, quick review of the definitions and the theorems. This is the stuff we did Monday. Um, today, the new properties. They're based on the parallelogram, but they're slightly different than what you think. A lot of them are based on diagonals today, so we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, the word diagonal is something we've had in that previous section. Oh, uh, you have to do that in the homework. Oh, if you were gone Monday, we did have homework due. That was your page 397. Uh, that is due for anyone that was gone Monday or the people that were gone last Friday. That's due. Okay. Got a lot of okay, uh, well, let's get through these, and then after we're done with this stuff today, and this I'm going to go through that very, very quickly. I won't probably give you enough time to write it down. In certain cases, we have three new ones today. Here's our three new properties: six, six through six, eight. Those are our theorems. Um, I, I think these do not have names. I'm pretty sure they do not. Uh, they're based on diagonals. Most of them are anyway. Uh, we'll, we'll get to those here in a second. Um, but again. Main goal today, do these. And then at the very end of today is to do at least two examples of what your homework is going to eventually look like. We're not getting homework today or anything like that. But it's to show you eventually what our homework will look like. And we'll go through a couple of problems. Okay? Understand? Let's move on. All right, here we go. Let's jump right in. Uh, this is the definition we had Monday, parallelogram. Um, it is a quad with opposite sides being parallel. Here's the picture. Um, obviously, you can tell the top and bottom are parallel, the right and left are parallel. Parallel implies that they just don't touch. Extend the walls, they don't touch each other. Um, certain angles on that picture are equal because of parallel lines and transversals. But really, the only thing we know is that the walls don't touch. Now, the, the first properties we had on Monday, that was theorem 3, 6, 3, 6, 4, and 6, 5. Those talked about specific things about this picture in general. Now, the big thing was notation. Anytime they write this in their book or in your notes or in the test and directions on homework, um, they'll draw a map picture. They put the four letters from the picture that are on there, um, and they have to go in a circular pattern when they pick their letters. So if they start with like the letter D here, and you write any of the four letters, you can go in any order you want as long as you go in a circle pattern. So I could write, like, if I want to name this object ABCD, that's fine. Or I could call it DABC or DCBA. I can start with any letter, but I just have to go in a circular path because the letters have to be connected. So, like, A to B had to be connected, B to C had to be connected, C to D had to be connected as they spun around. I don't care if there's diagonals going through the middle. I'm talking about when you go in a circular pattern, you have to have the letters written next to a letter that's already connected to when you write like this. Uh, yeah, that's a weird notational thing. Some people, I don't know why, they just pick random letters when they write these quads down. Uh, but that was the, the definition. Now, the first theorem we had, I believe we called this the opposite sides theorem. Uh, this one said, in a quad that's a parallelogram, so you have a quad that's a parallelogram, the opposite sides are equal. This is something we're going to look at today immediately on those two examples we're going to do. We're going to look at how does this apply to a homework problem. I think I'd give you a bunch of examples on Monday of this. But this is what it's saying. Anytime you have a parallelogram, the opposite walls have to be the same size. They're equal in length. Most people look at that and go, well, isn't that common sense? Yeah, for the most part. Most people can kind of tell they look the same. But this, to prove it, was actually more challenging. Um, what we talked about was like drawing a diagonal and then proving that the triangles were equal and then using the parts of the triangle to actually prove that the walls were the same length. Because if the triangles are equal, then We'll also have to be the same. We'll go back through that later. That's going to be one of our proofs we're going to do later. But again, opposite sides are equal. So if you know if this wall over here, I think one of the numbers I used on Monday was like this is seven inches, then the opposite wall is seven inches. You can just transfer the numbers around. This will help you find area and help you find other things. <coughs> okay, are we going to a six three though? Here we did the proof. It only took us, I think, 
we did, I think we did an informal proof, but if you're gonna write it all down, I think it takes like four to five lines, something like that. All right, moving on. Six four. We call this one the opposite angles theorem. So this one said that if your quad is a parallelogram, the opposite angles in the corners are equal. They're congruent to each other. So here's your picture. So the opposite angles, the ones that diagonal from each other, they're equal. Diagonal. So M and K are the same angle. L and J are the same angle. Um, it's kind of obvious that certain angles are not equal to each other. Like, for instance, this is an acute angle. It's smaller than 90 degrees. You can tell that. It's not straight up and down, so it's smaller than 90. This is obtuse. It's past straight up and down. So, so you can definitely tell that these angles are not equal to each other. Most people can see that from the picture, especially when it's like more obvious, like when we really exaggerate the parallelogram like this. A lot of people can definitely see that this angle and this angle are different. Like when you really exaggerate it on a parallelogram. But what this one is saying is that the, the angles are across from each other. This angle is equal to this one down here. And we talked about the proof. And it, this one, if you were to prove this, you have to do like two full-on proofs to prove that the angles actually work. There's different ways to do it, but I've seen it with two full-on proofs. Okay, questions on the first two. 6-5 now. 6-5. Uh, I believe we call this one the consecutive angle theorem. Um, quad is a parallelogram again. Then the consecutive angles, uh, consecutive means angles one after another. We'll, we'll see that word here in a minute. I'll put that definition on the board for you. They're supplementary. It means they add up to be 180. So here's your picture. Um, the big thing here is knowing what consecutive means on that picture. And this is the same drawing that I gave you on Monday. Um, so how this works, if this is like 50 degrees, what they're saying is that no matter which direction you go, if I went you know, right and left or I went up and down, those are consecutive angles. They're angles that are right next to each other. They're not, they're not physically like adjacent, like where they're connected to each other. They're just side by side. They're one after another if you spin clockwise or counterclockwise. Well, whatever direction you go, these angles are said to be consecutive. So consecutive means angles, um, one angle after another. One angle after another. They, they do not have to be adjacent. Adjacent means that they're physically connected at like the vertex. So in this case, my letter Y would have to be 130, because these two have to add up to be 180. So X plus Y equals 180. And it didn't matter which direction you went. If you went you know, this direction, same exact idea. Those are consecutive. Shh, you're talking. OK, questions with how this works. The theorem that I talked about on Monday, I said there, there was a theorem back in chapter three that proved it. It was theorem three, too, if you go back and look. It talked about consecutive angles in same side interior. That's what they're called. Um, what same side interior means, that when you have two parallel lines and you have a transversal cutting through them, these angles are said to be cons uh, are consecutive interior, same side interior. They're inside the parallel lines, so they're interior and they're on one side of the transversal, they're said to be supplementary. And that's this is the reason why this theorem actually works. Because you do have parallel lines, you do have transversals, and it's just following directly from a previous theorem that we've done. 3-1 was uh, alternate interior, 3-2 was same side interior, or consecutive interior. I think that's the words the book used. Questions at all about the three we did Monday? Now, I know, apologies, I didn't give you a lot of time if you were gone Monday to write those down, but again, I will put those on the website tonight. I'll update that on Monday. Okay, new properties. We have three new ones today. We're doing 6-6 six, six through 6-8. Six, These are the three that I want to cover today. And then after we're done, then I want to go through a couple examples of what the homework will look like. These are pretty straightforward. One of them is really surprising. Um, that happens in every textbook I have. I always hate that they put 6-8 at the back. Um, like, it's the last theorem that they talk about. I believe 6-8 should have been 
of this theorem in particular should have been all the way in the front. It should have been theorem 6.3. I'll explain that later when we get there. You'll see it. And I understand why they put it there, and I know why, because it goes with 6, 7, and whatnot, but they should have moved this earlier. I'll explain once we get there. But first one we have theorem 6, 6. Uh, again, we don't have names for these. Uh, parallelogram. So you have a parallelogram. It has one right angle in the corner. One right angle. What we're trying to show is that if it has one right angle in a parallelogram, all the angles are right angles. All four of them are right. It's going off of that, the previous two theorems we did about angles. And the next two after this will go after um, diagonals. So I'll let you write it down. So you have a parallelogram that has one right angle in the corner. I'll show you the picture here in a minute. We have to prove that all the angles are right angles. Question. Yes. Let me give you the picture here, and then we'll go through the proof, the mini proof of it. Here's my right angle. So we have a parallelogram, so it's a four set of figures, it's got parallel walls but it has one right angle on it. So we do know it is a parallel term. That was the stipulation right of the hypothesis, the if part. But we have one right angle. My goal is to prove that all four of them are right by using previous theorems. Now, it's pretty easy. I'm not going to do the full-on proof. I'm just going to show you how this works. So if this is a right angle, then according to uh, the second theorem that we had, 6.4, the opposite angle is equal. So this is the opposite angle. Uh, that's angle L to J. So these angles are equal if it's a parallelogram. That was one of our theorems. So this would also have to be a right angle. So that's that first step is using theorem 6.4. Opposite angles are equal. So I can transfer that 90 diagonally. Okay, that's immediately I can do that right away using 6.4. To find the other two that are missing, now you have to rely on consecutive angles, which is 6.5. So now I'm going to be using theorem 6.5, which says the angles that are right next to each other, whichever direction you want to go, let's say I want to go this way, these two. These angles, let's call this x, these two have to add up to be 180. They, they have to be supplementary. They're consecutive. So angle, angle, K, angle K plus angle J have to make 180. They're consecutive angles for one after another. Uh, we already know that angle K is an X. We know that angle J is 90. So I'm substituting those in. I would, I would subtract the 90 across, and what's 180 minus 90? 90. 90. 90. So this angle would have to be 90 degrees by using a little bit of algebra. And then I can use 6.4 again and transfer it diagonally this way. So yes, all four angles in the picture are 90s because one of them was 90. I'm telling you right now, if you have one angle in a parallelogram, you can find all the rest of them because of these two theorems, 6, 4, and 6, 5. If you know one of them is a right angle, you can use the 6, 6 to just put all the right angles in there. What you're actually looking at here is the first, is this is the first step to figure out the definition of a rectangle. That's something we're going to do in the later sections. We'll talk about rectangles. We'll come back to it. Questions at all about 6, 6? You have one right angle, all the rest of them have to be right, because the angles can bounce around the picture. But it did require a little bit of algebra. Yeah, I don't think this one had a name. Pretty sure it didn't. Questions at all about the one? Does anyone need a little more time to write that one down? I'm going a little fast today. I want to make sure we get through all three of these today for sure. We're in good shape. We have about 20 more minutes. Ah, 16, 17. Yeah, it takes silence is a good thing. Let's move on. Let's go to the next one. Six, seven. Now, now these two, six, seven, six, eight, the last two that we're going to do today, they have to deal with diagonals. 
So when you have a quad, you can draw diagonals. There's two diagonals in a picture. Diagonals go across the picture through the interior. They connect the uh, vertices that aren't connected. This, these two properties talk about very specific things about the diagonals themselves. Okay, first one. Quad is a parallelogram, so you have a parallelogram to start with. The diagonals will bisect each other. Bisecting means they'll cut each other in half, perfect pieces. But each one will bisect each other. It doesn't say that the diagonals are equal in length. It says that when they cross each other, they'll cut each other in perfect halves. So I'll explain with our first picture here, but I'll let you write that down. the picture so we have a parallelogram but we're talking about the diagonals themselves so the diagonals here now on this picture it, you can ignore the wall markers I just pulled the picture out of the book this is the picture they kept using in the homework so I just I pulled that picture uh, but anyway uh, the diagonals here are what we're talking about can you definitely see that they're different lengths like the diagonals themselves in fact we know it's a parallelogram, the opposite walls are equal, but I'm just going to put my ruler on the board to just to prove the point. Because some people look at it and they're like, well, where they kind of look like they're the same size. It's an optical illusion. Your guys can't picture it, but they are most definitely of different length. I'm going to use centimeters here. Um, that's about ooh, what is it, 50 centimeters. I'm going to go to the direction so I can make you measure that. Um, that's one, yeah, it's 50, so that's 50 centimeters. 50 centimeters going from here to C. And then going the other direction, this is only 30 centimeters. Like, it's way off. Like, the difference between that is this length. Like, they're a ways off of each other. It's just kind of a weird thing. Some people can't see that. So the diagonals are definitely different length. But what they're talking about in this theorem is that when they cross each other right at point P, this stick right here is equal to this one. That's what they're talking about. That they split each other in halves, like perfect pieces. And then this piece right here, I'll put a little four on it. That piece is equal to this one. So if I know that this is 30, then this would be 15 and 15. Like it's perfect tab. Um, if this is 50, then this is 25 and 25. That's what we're going to try to show. I'm going to try to prove it. Now there's a couple of different ways to do this, and um, and there's another, you know, there's another motive why I picked this picture as well from your homework because the book had some other pictures that they had. Um, the way that they have the walls, certain walls marked because of the first theorem, opposite walls are equal. That will actually make this theorem, like the proof of it, a lot easier to understand. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do the first proof. Now the proof is um, incredibly short. Um, but to prove that they actually bisect, you have to actually show that the walls are of equal length without numbers. But I think the proof is easy once you see this picture. There's actually two ways to do it. Um, but what we know right now is we have a parallel ring. So we have certain walls are parallel. This wall is parallel to that one. So here's how, here's how I learned it when I was in college. Number one, you write, you know, the walls are parallel. Fine. Step one, certain walls. A, B is parallel to C, D. A, D is parallel to B, C, blah, 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 whatever. Step two, you write certain walls are equal. That's the markers I have on my picture. That's the way I learned it when I was in college. So A, B is equal to C, D. Got it. A, D is equal to B, C. Got it. That was their first theorem, 6.3. And the opposite walls are equal. What are we on? Third step. Third step of the proof. Since I know that certain walls are parallel, and we already have the diagonals in here, this angle right here is equal to that one. Those are alternate interior. That was um, theorem 3, 1 back in chapter 3. Alternate interior angles. They hopscotch their way into the picture. So since the top and bottom are parallel, then the top and bottom angles are equal. 
And I could do it the same for the other side. I could say that this angle right here is equal to this one because of the same reason, alternate interior, since I have two sets of diagonals. Now, why this is important, why I would ever mark those, is because now I have, I have a triangle, if you can see this, I have the triangle on the top, this top triangle here, and this bottom triangle, the smaller triangle here. Those triangles are now actually equal to each other, if you can see it. Because I have three marks in each triangle. I'm going to ignore the side markers. Uh, this marker is an, an angle marker. That's a side marker. That's an angle marker. So by ASA, the two triangles are equal. Well, if the two triangles are equal, then certain parts about the triangles are the same. Namely, since this top triangle is equal to the bottom triangle, this wall has to be equal to that wall. Those are visually matching parts. Um, how I know that that's a visually matching part? Since the two triangles are equal by ASA, this wall is connecting the single angle marker to the middle, single angle marker to the middle. So these walls are visually matching. They're the walls that touch the same angle marker. So th those are equal. And, and then the second part, this wall would be equal to this wall because those are visually matching. Now this wall going from here to the middle is touching the double angle marker to the middle, double angle marker to the middle. So yeah, these two walls are visually matching, so they're equal. Right, those are corresponding parts, C, B, C, D, C. And that proved that they actually did bisect each other. So somebody give me a random number. 12. 12, I heard 12, and I heard what, 34? Is that the other number I heard? 12 and 34. Okay, so let's say, so going back to my original number, let's say that this whole wall here is 12. 12, and let's say it's 12 inches. Well, if that's 12 inches, then this is 6 inches and 6 inches. That's how useful it is. I can immediately cut the two parts in half. And then the other number was, what, 34? That was the other number I heard. So let's say that that wall is longer, it's 34. Well, then that'd be, what, 17 and 17. You can immediately cut the numbers. And that can be decimals. It doesn't really matter. Um, as long as you know that you can cut the walls in half and immediately know what the, the, the two parts are. Questions on 6.7. The diagonals bisect each other, if there's two of them. That works on any type of parallelogram. Rectangles, rhombus, squares, it all, they all work the same. Now, those other, those other shapes, rectangles, squares, and rhombuses, those have unique properties. Um, they have their own special ones, but they also have all the ones that we previously talked about. We'll see those in a later section. Okay. Last theorem today. Last theorem. Here it is. Six, eight. It also has to deal with the diagonal. And this is the one that I said earlier. I wish they would have pushed this theorem earlier. That they would have put it almost in the beginning. Six, three. The one we did Monday. I almost wish they had it up earlier. I realize why they did it. Because it talks about diagonal. So they just saved it. But you'll see why. So here it says. Quad is a parallelogram. The diagonal separates the parallelogram into two equal triangles. That's the exact thing I've been using for every single theorem up till this point. This is actually, this theorem right now is the reason why all those other theorems work. And I've been using it the entire time. It's just now stating the obvious thing as its own theorem. So I don't have to keep going through all those steps. Now from now on I can just go, oh, these two triangles are equal, these two. And it's only using a single diagonal. So here it is. I have one picture of a parallelogram, and I put one diagonal in there, not both of them, where they're going to cross each other. One diagonal only. Well, this theorem is saying is that the two triangles have to be equal to each other. Without, you know, drawing, you know, angles and, you know, putting everything else in there anymore. I can just say immediately that they're equal. Because, let me explain. Why I know that they're, it's instantly, that these two triangles are instantly equal to each other. This is a parallelogram, right? So now, the way that I can show this, like in one second, why the two triangles have to be equal to each other, since this is a parallelogram, we know the opposite walls are equal, correct? So this wall and this wall are equal. And do you agree that both triangles share the wall in the middle? That's called a reflexive wall, right? Well, now I can prove that the two triangles are equal because of SSS. Three sides are marked, three sides are marked. So by SSS theorem, the two triangles immediately have to be equal to each other. Like, there's no doubts about it. But we never used that proof before. The proof that I've always done up to this point 
was to say, okay, since we have parallel walls, alternate interior angles are equal, this angle here is equal to that one because of the parallel walls, the reflexive wall in the middle, and by ASA, the two triangles are equal. That was one of our parts. I don't need to do that anymore. What this theorem allows me to do is immediately, when you have one diagonal, the triangles are immediately the same. They're the same in area, the same in everything. Angles are marked the same, everything. They're just connected to each other. Okay, questions with the three theorems up till this point. I wish this one would have been earlier. I understand why they saved it, because I can prove it multiple different ways now. Uh, but this is this is literally the reason why those other theorems worked. Because we proved that certain triangles were equal, and then we showed all those other properties about it. But I understand why they saved it, because now we can just assume from now on. But those are your first three of your text today. Okay, I don't know if we're going to get to two examples. Let's do the first example only today. Here's one of the homework problems. Okay, um, This is one that we're going to eventually see um, at some point this week, possibly as early as tomorrow. Um, the example says, you know, the following picture, W, X, Y, Z, is a parallelogram. Find all the missing values for T, R, and S. And you have to know exactly how this works. You know, because they have a lot of arrows pointing in different places. Certain things are angles, certain things are, are walls. How do you know the angles versus the walls? The angles will have the little degree symbol on them. So this is definitely an angle, it has a very clear arrow. This is definitely a wall length. So it's this wall right here from X to, what is this point in the middle? P, let's call it P. X to P, here is 7S plus 3. Um, this wall length right here, the P to Z, is an 8S, because they don't have a little degree symbol, so it's the wall length. This is the wall length, WX. Um, they have angles down here in the corner, they have little degree symbols on them, so these are the angles down here. And then this bottom wall is an 18. Now to solve this, to actually figure out, you know, T, S, and R, um, we can go in any order you want. Um, T, S, or R, which letter would you like to start with? T. 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 Okay, let's go after T. Um, this angle, there's a couple different ways to do it. I'll just do it the easiest way that I know. This is a 2T right here. They've kind of labeled it. That angle is equal to one of the angles on this picture. Which angle? Anyone know? 18. Say it? 18. It's, yeah, it's equal to this angle. Because that's an alternate interior. Those are actually equal angles. I actually have a lot marker there. there. Those angles are equal. Those are alternate interior. Since this is a parallelogram, alternate interior angles are equal. So 2T is equal to 18. So the T is a 9, if I divide by 2. So that's T is 9 degrees, if you want to solve it. That's the type of thing I would expect to see in homework. Maybe that's the first question that says, find, find T. Boom, there it is. T is 9. What's the next letter you guys want to go after? S or R? S. 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 We'll go after S. Okay, these walls, according to the theorem uh, 6.7, the diagonals split each other in halves. So, so those two walls have to be equal. So 8S would have to be equal to 7s plus 3. So to solve, you'd subtract the 7s across. 8s uh, minus 7s is a 1s. And s is equal to 3, because I don't need to put a 1 up front. I subtract the 7s across with 1s, which is just s. And then to find r, you set 4r equals 18. The top and bottom walls are equal. This wall is equal to that wall. 4r equals 18. Divide by 4. And you get something like 4.5. And yeah, it's a decimal, it can happen. Questions, comments, concerns? Okay, we'll save a couple more examples tomorrow. I got some out of the book that I'm picking. Um, tomorrow, make sure that you have some form of a text. I don't care if it's your hardcover, if, you're, if, it's your, uh, if you're, it's your Chromebook, I don't really care, but you'll need your textbook probably tomorrow.